One of the flyers, my friend uh, Dalen had put up, Dalen Williams, he had put up one of the flyers that shouted out Disco MC Eddie Chiba Starsky. So Disco, of course, was still uh, prominent and dominant when uh, hip hop was emerging and some of these flyers and, and shows were coming up. And uh, Dalen had also posted up the eight track of Rapper's Delight uh, that was on a somewhat of a compilation eight track. So uh yeah that was almost that was like original bootleg those are like some of the original bootlegs where you know that that one company would jack the popular singles and put out I, I i don't think those were cleared or you know i think that was definitely bootlegs well yeah since it had sugar hill gang and prince on the same right uh, right exactly. i don't think that was an authorized uh eight track <laughs> exactly you know? exactly so uh yeah. So Paradise, given that the uh, rappers delight in Sugar Hill Gang, you know they get a they a lot of people look at it negatively, but of course it also helped uh, break through the genre to many many people that weren't in the New York area. So I want you to explain why that song and having that eight track is so critical and important for what your guys' mission is. Well, the song Sugar Hill Gang Rapper's Delight goes without saying. It was the song that popularized hip-hop. In fact, I don't even know if we would be calling it hip-hop if hip-hop wasn't the first word of that record, you know? At the time that record was made, hip-hop, the hippie, the hippie to the hip, hip-hop was not a genre of music or the name of our culture, you know? It's just... uh the hook that stuck, you know? Um, it was monumental creating that record, you know, that Sylvia Robinson had the foresight to understand the power of rap music and how it needed to be recorded, you know, at the time. It was dominant music in the clubs, in the streets, and in the neighborhoods in New York City, you know? So it was inevitable. You know, but, um, you know, for that record, that record still plays very well, even though it's a 15 minute record. You can play that record at any party and any city in the world and it'll still rock the house. Yeah. And uh, for both of you from different perspectives with the Latin Quarter perspective, Paradise and then Pete Nice for you coming up. uh younger and not being an artist yet when you would see these routines and i have a lot of those tapes myself but they were not short routines like uh what ended up being rapper's delight what effect did having the cold crush or whoever you know furious five or whoever having these longer routines what effect did you see that have on the crowd and the audience as opposed to being three or four minute songs that the r b Artists. Well, we didn't have the three and four minute songs yet. We didn't play that. You know what I'm saying? Um, radio wound up turning it into that much later. At the time when we were creating hip hop, uh, Isaac Hayes, Barry White, James Brown, sometimes you have one single be the whole side of the whole album. You know, you look at those songs by uh, Barry White and <laughs> Isaac Hayes and James Brown and George Clinton. They were long formatted songs. It was uh, the radio station that uh, started creating snippets of songs so that they could play more commercials during the breaks. Well, right. and also when you look at Rapper's Delight, you know, even if you look at some Billboard magazines from earlier in 1979, they're doing articles about what's going on in the clubs in New York City with Hollywood and Eddie Chiba and how like the rapping DJs are taking over. And this is before, so this is this is kind of like what led up to Rapper's Delight and with Sylvia Robinson having the foresight to say, oh, I want to put this on record and capture this on record. And the way that she wanted Lovebug to be the one first and it didn't work out. And yeah, I mean, basically you have a lot of people argue, well, is DJ Hollywood a hip hop? Is Eddie Chiba hip hop? It's all hip hop. It's just all different yep. styles of hip hop at that time. And yep. I will say a lot of people diss Rapper's Delight, but 
if you were there at that time, that's the th that song was so huge and worldwide in such a short period of time. You you could say that if that didn't happen, you know, who knows? Maybe maybe hip hop would not have developed for another ten years. Maybe it just would have been the fad that everybody said it actually was. But yeah. that actually gave people like Russell Simmons, who was there right at the time and had kind of like the same ideas and was managing Curtis Blow and involved with Eddie Chiba and Hollywood, that 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 was kind of like the the foundation of the rec the rap record business, which is not yeah. necessarily exactly like, you know, hip hop, hip -hop. with the B boys and Cool Herc and, you know, all the elements. Um, there's a separate lane for like rap music and the, and the industry. And that really was born. And even if you look at Rapper's Delight, when you had the record, inside that record was an order form where you could order the Sugar Hill Gang t-shirt, the pennant, the photo. So that also was the first merchandise, the first merch ever in hip hop. So there were like so many foundational things that were tied to Sugar Hill Records. Also the first tours, you know, the Sugar Hill tour, in 1980 yeah. and 81, you know, you can't like, I mean, you can't just diss that and say that it wasn't yeah. as important as, as it is. And also, when you mentioned disco, um, uh, look how important was disco to hip hop? Foundational. If it wasn't for disco, there would be no hip hop. You know, 80 to 90 percent of the breakbeats that we use were disco records including, but not limited to, Good Times by Sheik. If you look at 1979, 90% um, of the rap records, maybe more than that, that came out in 79, had a disco beat. You know, Rapping and Rocking the House, uh, King Tim the Third, all the most popular ones. The only one that didn't have a disco beat was Flash and the Furious Five, first one. But they wound up, with 80, 90% of the songs in their careers were samples of disco music under Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five also. Yeah. So why do you guys think that either Sylvia Robinson or Rapper's Delight or Sugar Hill Gang don't get more reverence? And then what are you guys doing to hopefully change? Reverence from who? Reverence from who? I would say from basically anybody. Or I just, it's just the, the mainstream media that doesn't give it the reverence it deserves. And, um, you know, they're, they're not the standard bearers of our culture. If you ask any of the standard bearers of our culture, the legends and pioneers of hip hop or the legendary pioneering DJs, you'll get the similar conversations that me and Pete give you. You know, uh, matter of fact, how important is disco? You mentioned disco on the flyers of the past. I'll tell you this. Me and Pete found the first flyer that had the word hip hop on it. And that flyer is from 1979 and it's from Brooklyn. And I would like to challenge everybody that call themselves a historian or a collector to find a flyer earlier than the one that we have with the word hip hop on it. That would be awesome to see. <laughs> so. Also on uh, your hip hop museum tour, I'd seen you had the the backdrop for Big Daddy Kane, which of course is several years later. And of course, I grew up in Maryland, but in DC in particular, with Go Go concerts, we had the backdrops and taking pictures and different things, both yep. for the Go Go Same artists. Culture. Look how, and this is what I tell people. Honestly, if you really, really want to know, there really even ain't no such thing as hip hop. Hip hop is the unified indigenous, Afro indigenous culture from worldwide that we sampled the best of black culture from around the world. And then we added the rest of all cultures. You know, hip hop is like the cultural version of Star Trek's Borg. Resistance is futile. You will be assimilated. And we've seen that happen for the last 50 years, for sure. Yeah. But uh, Pete, with the uh, Big Daddy Kane backdrop in particular, uh, why was that so important? And what does that represent to you and to the overall cultural snapshot? Well, I mean, personally, that was like one of my earliest door 
working with third base. We went out with Kane for the Big Daddy Thing tour. And, you know, who was on that tour? You know, Digital was on that tour. So you got a young Tupac who's just the hype man and the guy who would carry bags, basically. You know, that that's like the Tupac that I knew and was introduced to first. So that brings back, you know, personally, uh, on a sidebar, just brings back nostalgia of that tour with, with Kane. But that those backdrops, like you said, the tradition of taking photographs and Polaroids in front of that type of backdrop, and the fact that that was a backdrop behind Mr. C on that entire tour. And to take it a step even further, that incorporates Kane's medallion that was, you know, his main thing at that point. And that doesn't exist anymore. Um, he does not have it, does not know what happened to it. And that's like, key to a lot of things like the gems of you know hip-hop history that are not they don't exist anymore however dj ross who has the rap tees book they did make a promo pin of kane's medallion at cold chillin at some point and that has survived <laughs> so it's kind of like also the representation of the jewelry but, you know, the book Ice Cold, I'm actually helping out the Museum of Natural History with Vicky Toback. They're doing a big retrospective in history of hip hop jewelry next year. So, you know, that was one of the things on our list. I tried to track down Kane's medallion. I we talked to Kane last week and, you know, he said, nah, man, that's that's long gone. You know, either it got melted down or got lost. Who knows what happened? But but so in, in general, just just with Kane's importance in hip hop, the golden era, and just to have something that's that rare, those backdrops just don't exist. Like Shirt Kings, I think they even have been, you know, looking for a couple of their original ones. And uh, it's just, you know, another fabric of, you know, one of the staples of hip hop culture. And, you know, anyone who has one of those Polaroids that, you know, took in front of one of those, you know, painted backdrops is, uh, you know, just something that hip hop has embraced and you know been built upon. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, with the the hip hop treasures that you guys do too, with the Biz Marquee, speaking of the chains and Cold Chillin' and Big Daddy Kane and the crew, that was awesome with his wife and talking about that as well. So if everybody hasn't watched that, check that out as well. And uh, Paradise, I wanted you to speak on. Uh, one thing that I I saw too that you guys had been installed uh, New York City with Mayor Eric, Eric Adams, and him putting up the flyers of Public Enemy in the third base, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, Paradise, I wanted you to explain the significance, seeing from what hip hop, what we now call hip hop, was in the '70s to now to where the mayor of New York is actually embracing it, because all three of us know growing up. It was not embraced by the status quo. It was, in in fact, dismissed and debased in a lot of ways. Uh, so for you, Paradise, seeing it come full circle like that, what's the significance for you personally and professionally? Well, personally, it's the same thing. It's like it wasn't just an indictment on hip hop when the mainstream was attacking hip hop. They was attacking me personally. You know, everything about what we did they were attacking, you know, and like, you know, hip hop is the number one genre in the world right now. Everybody eating off it. So, you know, um, with that, you know, that bag that hip hop is gifted to the world from the Bronx, you know, that's what keeps it moving. Because if, if it didn't make dollars, it wouldn't make sense. You know, they talked about us so badly, you know, and we was a fad. You know, we wasn't real. We didn't have any talent. You know, we couldn't sing. All we did was steal their stuff. Not only that, but hip hop was illegal, period. You know, we didn't have permits when we came out in those parks. Some people were able to get permits, but we were children. We were 12, 13 years old. How can a 12, 13 year old worry about getting a permit to come out in the park with their equipment? We busted the light pole open. That was illegal. That was breaking and entering. We cut the wires to the light poles and plugged in and took the electricity. That's theft of services, you know? And then many times to get the turntables, the mixer, the records, it took money 
And um, a lot of us were stick up kids or we, we boosted to get our equipment. And it was just a, a wild situation, you know, that uh, we had basically nothing, but we had the foundation of our ancestors and elders that we could create something from little, you know, that's where beatboxing came from. That's where, you know, many of the, 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 the makeshift instruments and the, the using mismatched equipment came from to actually come up with the concept of how to even create hip hop came from. 